What's up, y'all? Welcome to What the Fuck is Happening with the Fed. I'm Colin Harper, your host, and I'm with CK Snarks of POV Crypto and Bitcoin Magazine. How you doing, man? Finding safety in SAS, y'all. Hell yeah, man. And cash. And some gold. <laughs> yeah, man. Stack, stack a little bit of gold, Bitcoiners. I don't care what other, other Bitcoiners say. It's not a shit coin. But uh, you want to give a shout out to one of our sponsors, CK? Yeah, so let's talk about our sponsors. Honestly, I, I love our sponsors for, for WTF because they are so damn Bitcoin. The first is Swan Bitcoin, the newest and best way for Americans to stack on the cheap. I just set up actually my, my weekly dollar cost averages, but essentially they find the absolute cheapest way possible for you to get your sats. They allow you to set reoccurring buys and then allow you to have that Bitcoin withdrawn to your wallet that you custody on your own, either an XPUB or just a the same address every time. But they are building the onboarding tool for Bitcoiners and they want to transform as much USD into BTC as possible. You know, they're going to keep their product as simple as possible um, and they are going to focus on education. So they already have a side project called Give Bitcoin, which is the easiest way for you to receive Bitcoin as a gift or to give it um, as a gift. And that comes with educational resources. And their website, swanbitcoin.com, is just absolutely stocked full of great resources. And they are friends with the best in the industry, just putting together good education and focusing on education and cheap ass onboarding. Highly recommend if you live in the US, 49 states, go to swanbitcoin.com, check it out, set up your automatic buys and start stacking. And for you cypherpunk Bitcoiners out there, if you haven't checked out BISC yet, you should definitely check out BISC. Now's a good time to stack the dip. I don't know. We might go lower. Maybe we'll go higher. Who knows what Bitcoin's going to do? We're surging right now, I think, as we're recording. So you should download BISC right now. It is Bitcoin's really only true decentralized exchange, and it's run over Tor. They have an order book that matches you with Bitcoiners from all around the world, a bunch of different payment options. Uh, you can even send cash through the mail, which is fucking gnarly. That's pretty awesome. It's the exchange of last resort. Yeah, it is. It's awesome. I, I, I've used it. Uh, CEK's used it. It's a great way to stack anonymously. And uh, it's a great way to really get your feet wet also with just downloading your own instance of something. If you've never like run your own node or anything like that, um, because whenever you run BISC, you're running your own instance of their software. You're playing a part in their network and you're playing a part in Bitcoin's network uh, by buying on BISC. So go check them out. Uh, great exchange. Highly recommend. I think uh, we should just go ahead and dive into it, right? WTF is up with the Fed this week, Colin. The Fed has been busy. It is establishing repo facilities for foreign banks and foreign central banks now as the international community clambers for dollars. Even as money printer goes burr, they still want the USD, man. And also... U.S. agencies are considering making modifications to the Volcker Rule, which is a rule that mandates that U.S. banks cannot use uh, consumer deposits to fund investing in things like private equities, hedge funds, and other investments. The the key point here being that there's still a liquidity crisis, and uh, the Fed is trying to loosen regulations in domestic markets to get more uh, to get more loans and get more liquidity flowing through some of these smaller financial institutions. And in abroad, you know, everyone wants dollars, so the Fed's going to give it to them. You want a dollar, you get a dollar. Oh, speaking of that, like the twelve hundred dollars that Americans are supposed to get. The news blurb today was it's supposed to happen. They're supposed to be shipped by the end of April at the latest, but it might take as long as 20 weeks. So if you got bills to pay because of Corona, sorry, guys, uh, the U.S. dollar is an incredible shit coin. They can't even, you know, just you just add the twelve hundred dollars to people's bank accounts, man. It's all it's all digital dollars anyway. Why does it matter? It's, it's incredible. The inefficiency is baffling. You need to send them a Corona infested check. <laughs> I mean, honestly, it's dirty as shit. But seriously, think about it. The U.S. dollar was actually like a shit coin. Like, think about it, the U.S. dollar was like Litecoin, right? Like even like, like Ethereum or something. There could have been a hard fork already. You just airdrop people, you know, the equivalent sum, you know, whatever, $1,200 worth of Litecoin. Legacy digital currency tech. Can't even do a proper airdrop. You can't, man. All right, well, let's get into this. This is some heavy stuff. I mean, you, you mentioned uh, direct, direct liquidity deposits for foreign banks. Uh, explain that. What's happening? 
they're offering repo. So, so yeah, so like, you know, short term loans for, for, for the interbank lending market. Uh, but they're, they're, they're going to do it directly with central banks as well, which is interesting. I'm not like qualified to talk about that. Can you re-explain uh, what happened in the repo market in the U.S. briefly and then kind of explain how that gets applied to, uh, you know, non-domestic banks? In, in the U.S., the way the repo market works is when banks need to satisfy obligations or payments at the end of a business day, they take short-term loans from other banks to satisfy those obligations. When the liquidity is not there and banks don't have, you know, are charging too high of interest or, you know, they don't want to lend out their cash because they're, they, they just can't get rid of it or they have, or it's tied up because of regulations, then the Fed steps in and offers, uh, you know, those loans at a much lower interest rate. So they're going to be doing the same thing with foreign banks. Um, they're going to be saying, okay, well, we'll give you short-term loans so that you can get dollars into your, you know, into your financial systems. We're going to take whatever collateral you have. And, you know, they're, they're just extending the dollar's liquidity uh, across the international financial scene because there's been a flight to the dollar. It's amazing. Even as we continue to print, people still want the dollar. It's still the strongest currency in the world. Um, because the Fed is guaranteeing liquidity everywhere. So it's it's a safety flight right now. It is the flight to the dollar because the Fed is guaranteeing liquidity or is it because the dollar is the global reserve currency and the most liquid currency? Like I see this it's, as a lesson of liquidity. Like this is why liquidity is so powerful. Yeah, I think that's definitely liquidity first, obviously. Um, but for the foreign banks especially, isn't it amazing that the thing that is the most liquid is also almost guaranteed at this point by it, the source of like, you know, you, it's like a faucet that never turns off. Right. Um, so long as you've got a bucket to keep the water in, you can keep drawing from it. Um, and so that's also incentive for these banks, I believe. And for these financial institutions, I would like to have someone on to talk about the central banks borrowing. Um, Cause that just means that they're probably going to take that, those dollars and recycle them through their own, their own economies and their own financial systems. If I, if I had a hunch, but yeah, I mean, this happens just after, you know, the fed's been doing dollar swap lines with, uh, banking entities, which, um, I, I don't, I don't know too much about it. It's a Forex thing, obviously, but I, I don't know too much about how that works, but basically, you know, they're opening lines to do business with, I mean, all you don't really need to know how these financial, uh, tools work to understand that the fed is playing with house money so they can do whatever they want with these markets. Right. Like they're, they're offering liquidity to markets all across the spectrum for X markets, central banks, uh, private uh, and uh, investment banks in, in foreign markets. So I think that's really one of the takeaways here is it's not just local. It's, 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 it's global. Is Stephanie Kelton right? Can the U.S. afford anything that is priced in its own currency? Yeah, they absolutely can. That's the thing is like MMT, we're like, we are living MMT for those who are listeners, modern monetary theory is, is, is the idea that the government can insure any debt and obligation that it wants to, or, or pay for any debt and obligation that it wants to. Specifically the U.S. Or, or, or the EU technically, but does, the EU doesn't have the purchasing power, obviously the U.S. does. But um, it's basically the idea that as long as you can cover uh, your, you know, as long as you can cover the printing and... Uh, as long as you're making, you know, I guess, smart and savvy decisions about what you're buying or how you're choosing to buy to and how you're choosing to use inflation to boost the economy, it can work out long term. But yeah, the, the United States government can buy anything priced in its currency, absolutely. Uh, or the Federal Reserve can, which, you know, is the, the, the federal government. And I would love to have, hopefully one day we can have uh, either Joe Weisenthal on or her to talk about MMT because it's, it's absolutely crucial. Like this is where we are going. Absolutely. Uh, this is the next evolution of Keynesianism and Bitcoin will coexist alongside of it. Like, and I've been saying this actually for a while is like, you're going to have state money and you're going to have hard money. And I do believe that people are going to use both in the future and for, for different reasons. Uh, because I think that also this is all uh, on this rant in a second, you know, this is not the last $1,200 check we're going to see in America. Uh, we're going to see more. UBI very well could be a thing. Just depends on, and I don't think it's going to be a persistent thing all the time. You know, it's not, we're not always going to have UBI. It's not going to be something in our everyday life, but maybe during times of crisis, that's a new bazooka, you know, that the government could pull out. 
I know that in Canada, they're getting substantial relief and they're getting several months worth of checks. I was actually talking to a minor guy in Canada earlier before this call. And he said that the, the Canadian dollar is getting hammered right now. But miners are actually doing pretty well because their their profits are priced in dollars. Yeah, BTC and Tether. Oh, uh, right, man. I mean, stable coins have been popping off, right? Bitcoin Bitcoin is over uh, 10K if you measure in uh, Canadian dollars. I feel like people need to take into account that Bitcoin is not only up against the dollar. Bitcoin is up against individual fiats. Yeah, Bitcoin is up against everything, but the dollar is like, that's like Zeus, you know, that's like Saturn or something, right? That's like the, that, that, that's the, that's the big poppy, big poppy of all of them. Then the EU is kind of like, I mean, the EU, the, the euro is kind of like the, the degenerate sun, you know, it's kind of doing it, but he's really prodigal and he's really just kind of fucking up. Anyway, I, w- I want to kind of launch into talking about this uh this revoking the, the vocal rule or potentially modifying it right they like to cloak it in this in this you know sugary language again give us the quick uh intro on the dodd frank act so the, the dodd frank act broadly was a bill or was an act that congress uh put into place after the 2008 financial crisis the vocal rule mandates that banks cannot use customer deposits for investments for profit in things like private equities and hedge funds and other things like that. And the reason for this is before 1990, under Bill Clinton, Glass-Steagall was repealed, banks used to be split up into commercial and investment, where you just have the bank for commercial, so for things like businesses and individuals, and then an investment bank. The banks would actually invest for profit in other things like other ventures or funds, all that stuff. Uh, when Glass-Steagall was repealed, then they merged those two. And that's when you have big, the big monoliths like U.S. Bank, J.P. Morgan, Citigroup, all that kind of stuff. They're considering modifying the Volcker Rule, which will allow banks to take customer deposits and use them for investment purposes and things like hedge funds and uh, private equities, which would uh, breaks down a barrier that we've erected twice in, in, in regulation. And you know, and the reason they're doing it is because my, I think this is part of the reason why there's been such a liquidity crunch even as far back as September in the repo market. Because the banks can't make these can't make these loans because of regulations. So the ba- the Fed and regulators want to break these uh, constraints so that they can uh, free up some liquidity. So something, uh, but it means, and you know, it's sorry. One last thing: it's coming just after the Fed said that reserve requirements are null. So banks don't even have any reserves on hand for their customers. So it's one step at a time, you know. It's, 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 it's slowly, but then all at once. What were you going to say? I was going to say, it sounds like there's a crisis. They put up a rule to protect investors and protect consumers. And another crisis happens. And then they have to remove that rule in order to make the, the system float. And then rinse and repeat. I mean, this is, again, going back to, I think, what we said last uh, episode, this is the Ron Paul argument of like the debt cycles that build up and bust every like decade and if you see it it's happened it happened in 2000 with a dot-com bubble it's ha- it happened in 08 and 09 it's happening now like it's 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 literally every turn of the decade you know we'll see what happens again they're, they're just considering um revoking it or not even revoking it modifying it but who knows you know that's that's that that could mean anything so we'll see what they end up doing with it my hunch is they probably will modify it and allow and free up some liquidity the other thing we haven't really talked about yet is the unemployment statistics, uh, which is why I think, you know, the, the first check is not going to be the last. I mean, we had 6.6 million uh, th- this last week, um, which is crazy. I mean, that's we're, we're, we're at 10 percent now. You know, the Great Depression, when it was at its worst, it was like, what, 25, 20, 25? We're definitely heading in that direction. And like, at what point do people stop saying it's a recession and start calling it a depression? Because like, honestly, like that's, I mean, it's too early for that now, but I feel like that's where we're headed. I feel like I'm in a bubble because I'm taken care of and I'm not seeing other people and I'm just like in my bubble, but I see all these news stories about unemployment, uh, people graffitiing about not paying rent next month and all this kind of stuff. So it's definitely brewing. It's definitely bubbling. Yeah. And they think, you know, why should we? Because you see Subway and all these other fucking, you know, fast food joints saying they're not going to pay rent. So why the fuck should anyone have to pay rent? You know, the Federal Reserve wanted to, they just put a big old freeze on the entire financial system, which would be catastrophic. But um, I don't think they'll actually do that. 
but you see stuff like that and then you see all these people see all these corporations getting bailed out and they think absolutely why why, why should i have to do this and you know the fed encouraged banks to make responsible small loans to people right now that was that was another thing that they announced i actually heard someone at the bank earlier today i was getting some cash from the atm a woman saying that she needed a loan to pay her bills and she was hoping reasons was going to give it to her and that's the state where a lot of like the average american is in we're thinking about month to month paychecks you know it's been one month people like in one month yeah it's been one month it's going to get gnarly and it's going to get gnarly in about half a year, man. I mean, that's, I think that's when you're really going to start seeing the ramifications of a lot of, not just what like the unemployment and what coronavirus is doing to economies, but like what, what the Fed's uh, intervention is going to do. To, and, and especially a year from now, you know, the cost of things, um, cantillion effect, inflation, all of that good stuff. And I'm, I'm, I'm interested in the housing market right now. That's the next big thing that I want to, I'm, I'm going to try to tune into because I've been seeing a lot of stuff like a, bunch of over leverage like airbnb super host and like my landlords that can't pay their mortgages because no one's renting like who would have thought that like are we gonna get another we're gonna get another fucking mortgage crisis man we've learned nothing like thinking about the over leveraged uh landlords and air specifically airbnb hosts that are running like massive airbnb businesses shit is about to hit the fan and it it feels a lot like Maybe it's slightly more responsible than 2008 where, you know, strippers were owning three homes in Miami. But I don't know, man. Uh, I mean, think about it's it. It's not like it, the end result is pretty bad. Yeah. And it's even more systemic because now it's rich people who are, who are getting effed because rich people are some of the most leveraged, over leveraged people. Out yeah, there. for sure. Or it might even be a guy who had like one home and decided after the financial crisis and properties were cheap. It's like, oh, wow, two, you know, 1% interest rate. That's pretty good. Bought a bunch of properties, you know, in New York, Nashville, Denver, San Francisco, you name it, and uh, decided to do that because it was paying pretty good. And in the, in the, in the party cities, it was great because, like, tourism was booming. And now there's not going to be any tourism for half a year or a year. And now they're fucked. Uh, and, it's, I mean, it's just the shockwaves haven't even hit yet is the crazy thing. Um, I don't want to sound like too much of an alarmist, but like we haven't even begun to see what this is going to do uh, what, and what it's going to do to just like all industries, Bit, you know, the Bitcoin industry from all of its aspects included. I just really want to stress though, like these are not stupid people making bad mistakes, right? These are really smart business people that were winning. Like up until January, 2020, these people were winning a lot right? They were absolutely crushing it. Now we're seeing that people have been misallocating capital the whole time because there's always this chance that a black swan could hit and that, you know, people, the economy would freeze up and people would need some, some cash. Um, and no one was, was saving cash. And now that's, this is the ramifications where everyone is misallocating capital to other things and not saving anything. Uh, we, we are seeing that really come to the forefront. Yeah, and we're seeing um, what happens when the Federal Reserve says, okay, we're going to basically guarantee liquidity at this, at this interest rate for years. I mean, the Federal Reserve, we didn't even get above 2.5%. I mean, that's incredible. Interest rates all throughout American history have, have fluctuated. And they've usually been in the, in the realm of, you know, like sometimes they've been, as, you know, they've gotten as high as 20%, you know, you got gotten 10%, things like that. Uh, but banks lend at each other at interest rates they feel comfortable with. And the Fed offered interest rates from zero to two point five percent from two thousand eight until two thousand, yeah, until two thousand eighteen. That's the yeah, they 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 ratcheted it up in two thousand eighteen. Um, I think above two point five percent, like to two to two point seven five percent. And businesses were able to borrow liquidity so cheaply and just do whatever they want. And they got over leveraged over leveraged with it. That's what you're seeing in the airline industry. Uh, speaking of that, I want to look at uh, one one thing too for today. I want to pull up a chart that a Reddit user made about where the funds are going for the stimulus bill. Um, and uh, I'll post it in the show notes on Twitter as well, because it's fat. It's fantastic. And I think everyone should read it. The cares act is a $2 trillion relief package that gives large corporations, 500 billion um, out of those large corporations out of that 500 billion, there's, 58 billion that are going to the airlines 
uh, three billion of that will go to contractors for employment protection. Four billion will go to wages and benefits to cargo workers. Twenty-five billion will go to passenger workers' uh, wages and benefits. Uh, there's twenty-six billion that's listed as for other, and seventeen billion will go to national security, which I assume has to do with Boeing. Five hundred sixty billion of this bill will go to uh, individuals in the United States. Three hundred billion of that will be cash payments, and two hundred sixty billion will be extra unemployment payments. Uh, Forty-three point seven billion will go to student loans and other, and one hundred fifty-three point five billion goes to public health to fight coronavirus. Or no, no, the, sorry, that's just public health. The coronavirus relief is uh, 274 billion and it's part of a of 339 billion that goes to state and local governments what are you showing me here oh that's a good meme that's a really good meme describe the meme that you're seeing (laughs) the meme is it says it shows a bunch of SWAT team members it says next month with the ram and it says rent and then behind him are utilities grocery healthcare. it sums it up pretty well back to the bill I mean, like $65 billion goes in like block grants, uh, education stuff, and stuff like that. And there's also a safety net for food banks, child nutrition, SNAP, which is a paltry $26 billion. <clears throat> $500 billion to corporations, $560 billion to individuals, $377 billion to small businesses. Uh, new loans, uh, $350 billion, which will be new loans, $10 billion, which will be grants, and, and $17 billion, which will be re- relief from existing loans. So big old relief package, a lot of money getting thrown around, $2 trillion, billions getting thrown all over the place. And uh, yeah, I mean, you know, 560 billion of this goes to the American people, 500 goes to the corporations. You got you to bail out the airlines, man. What, what, what would we do? If we didn't have those airlines that we're not using right now. Theoretically, without bailing out those corporations, then they'd have to fire all the workers. So aren't they just ensuring that the workers get that paycheck still? Is that what's happening? I mean, that's true to a point, but also, so look, if the airlines died, it would be painful, right? Because they would have to restructure. But under capital restructuring, you know, when someone else with, you know, when a private equity firm comes and buys that airline, they're not going to fire all the workers because that, that, you know, that makes, that, that, that's a headache for them if they fire all those workers because then they have to reteach every, you know, they have to go out and do a job hunt, rehire all of them, and then reteach them everything. Uh, so th- they would likely keep the workers. Now, the, the, the true thing is, is like, yes, until that restructuring happened, those workers would be furloughed, basically, or unemployed. Um, and so in, in the meantime, you know, so actually, you know, you could make the argument instead of fucking bailing out the airlines, you just take some of that money pay the airline workers while the companies get restructured. I'm not saying they necessarily should do that. Maybe that wouldn't be better, but at least that money would be going to the, to, to the people instead of the corporations. Uh, and then the corporations, you know, they, they fucked up. So they, they're going bankrupt. They sell their assets. Someone else will buy it up. Uh, that's the way a truly free market would work. Someone with cash. Yeah, no one's got it. I thought that this flow chart, it's really great. You should check it out. You can find it on Dig. You can also find it on Reddit. On uh, at r back yeah r slash data is beautiful it, it was user seven and forty we'll link it in the show notes all right so I think that about does it we've gone through the uh, FEMA repo facilities for foreign banks the consideration to modify the Volcker rule which would allow banks to use customer deposits on uh, profit investments in pre- uh, private equities and hedge funds and we also went over the CARES Act saw where some of that money's going uh, to round out the episode I want to look at. Uh, kind of like looking forward uh, towards what I think is going to be kind of important and newsline or headline worthy for news going forward. Uh, first of all, I want to keep track of the unemployment. Uh, like we said in the show, 6.6 million filed for unemployment last week. We'll see what those numbers are next week. And just in general, I kind of want to see what the shock waves are with the uh, economic shock from coronavirus and America shutting down and just the financial and economic crisis that's been going on. Uh, kind of see, you know, when is that shockwave really going to be felt and what are going to be the ramifications, uh, especially in things like the housing market, like what's going to be, ha- what's going to happen? How are, are people going to start defaulting on mortgages or is the bank going to step in to try to 
save a cascading uh, default, right? Where just all of these people can't pay their mortgages because they're over leveraged on these properties that they either can't rent out uh, for Airbnb or for actual rentals, things like that. No one just has any cash. I also want to see what's going to happen to some of these department stores. I mean, like the, the, the economy is going to shut down for, for months and who's going to guarantee some of these, uh, who's going to guarantee some of these loans and who's going to uh, guarantee that some of these companies won't go into bankruptcy. I mean, the, the feds shown that it's willing to provide liquidity to a lot of players. Uh, how far will it extend its reach? And that's going to really be the big thing, obviously, as we continue this podcast that we're going to be examining. At what point do we enter pure socialism? Like, I'm just curious, you know, this is, I, I like the market already doesn't work. Like we can't allocate capital anymore. We're already at socialism, baby. Like I was talking to my grandma the other day, my grandparents and my dad are big Trump supporters. I was like, how do you like that Trump era socialism, baby? Like, that's what it is. That's what the check is. I mean, libertarians always talk about corporate socialism. That's what corporatism is. So we're already there in some regards. It's just like, where are we seeing the money? You know, another thing coronavirus is going to do and all this Fed stuff, and this is where I'll stop. Uh, universal health care is coming. So sorry if you hate it, but just get ready for it. It's coming. All right, Colin, where can people find you, bro? You got a lot of good stuff. You guys can find me at As I Lay Hodling on Twitter. And you also find my author page on BitcoinMagazine.com. What about you, CK? Yep, CK underscore Snarks, doing this show with Colin, doing weekly happy hours, drinks in quarantine on Bitcoin Magazine, Twitter, and YouTube. Uh, you can find me also on my personal podcast at POV Crypto Pod, where it's uh, the Bitcoin versus Ethereum podcast. So doing a lot of stuff and super excited to continue demystifying what the fuck is happening with the Fed. Hell yeah, man. So tune in next week, guys, for the third episode. Uh, we're also hoping to get some, uh, uh, I don't want to call them mini episodes, but like side episodes where I, uh, we get some people on. Uh, like I'd really like to get Caitlin Long on. Uh, maybe uh, some, uh, hang on, like. Man, we got a wish list. Let's just ask yeah. the people, right? Yeah. Hey, Dan Tapiero, if you're listening, holler at us. Yeah, Kaylin Long, if you're listening, holler at us. Uh, Travis Kling, if you're, and Hans, if you're listening at us, uh, hit us up, please. Joe Weisenthal, we're looking for the best experts. Yeah, Joe. I don't, you're probably not listening to this, Joe, but if you are, hit us up. Stay safe, stay sane. Stay well. Take it easy, y'all. Enjoy the weekend. It's going to be the same as the weekday. A quick reminder that all of the content in this episode is for informational and entertainment purposes only. You should not construe the information as legal, tax, investment, financial, or any other advice. Nothing contained in this presentation constitutes a solicitation, recommendation, or offer by BTC Media, the Let's Talk Bitcoin Podcast Network, or any third-party service provider to buy or sell securities or any other financial instruments. Do your own research.